that was great. We're now going to go a little more in depth on the diet side of things, and we have a, a nutritionist, a dietitian who's come all the way from the United States, Leanne Burns. Thank you so much for giving us the next talk. Thank you for having me today. I came a long way from the States. I'm from New Orleans. I have a very deep Southern accent. I will spell words that you can't understand. <laughs> Just to give you a little bit back. First of all, I gotta apologize. I didn't send my disclaimer slide. And I, so I want you to know that I have participated with many, almost every, the two sponsors of today and many other pharmaceutical companies in the development of patient education for nutrition. I've also contributed to the education of nurses, doctors, and dietitians around the country um, to make sure that we get appropriate and the correct information out. Um, I did not, I, I don't have any bias today. This is a very independent talk and not sponsored by anyone. This is my slides. Uh, to give you a little background, I have been an oncology nutritionist for Gosh, I'm old, 30 years, contributing in areas of breast, cervical, colorectal. I've run cancer screens for many, many years. I moved to New Orleans in 2002 and went into practice with one some, or several, but particularly one oncologist that specialized in neuroendocrine neuro tumors, uh, Dr. Lowell Anthony, who's now in Kentucky. After seeing patients with him, I realized that I had to get good and I had to get good fast at recognizing the differences between neuroendocrine tumors and many of the other areas of oncology that I had been practicing. It's a different bird, and I know that you realize that. I also had the fortune of going in practice with several surgeons after Katrina because we had nowhere to practice. We came together and formed what uh, is now down at Oshner Kenner with LSU Partnership. Last year I retired, and I am not practicing. I do this. I come to support groups to help you. I speak in public areas where I can be a benefit. I, give you, I try to go to formats where I can directly work with what I think is the most important part of this disease, and that's patient support. So for that, I'm here today and a long way from home, and it's cold here. <laughs> So let me start so we can go through this information. Are you, is this my clicker? Yeah. Okay. So how do we choose the best diet for neuro, patients with neuroendocrine tumor? I wish I could tell you there's one way to do it, but there's not. So we're going to just talk today more about making selections that help you individually and how to use this information in trying to decide how you need to do this disease. So the best diet for neuroendocrine patients are just like diets for everybody else, but much more specific. A diet for patients living with neuroendocrine tumors are foods and fluids which the, with a nutritional value which your body can tolerate and absorb. Doesn't matter what people tell you, if your body doesn't absorb it or you cannot tolerate it, and you know that because it'll send you to the bathroom real quick, or it will run your blood sugars up, or you'll have some other flushing event. Those, those are not considered absorbable and tolerated foods. When dietitians look at trying to help people, they have to look at the medical history, and many times this medical history contributes to your individual needs. Each of us are different. Some of us have our diabetic way before we ever get diagnosed with carcinoid or neuroendocrine tumors. Some of us have high blood pressure and maybe controlling sodium and different issues at this point. Some of us had kidney disease, and we know that those are very specific. Fatty liver is very common. Let me tell you, I'm from New Orleans. I mean, it's fatty liver city. I mean, we, we, we do that to people. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, so, so these things may already be a contributing factor. Y'all may not do any of that up here. Um, <laughs> In South Louisiana, we have a lot of obesity. I have a job security. I can go into practice because we have a lot of obesity in the states. So this may be part of your already controlled diets. Surgeries contribute greatly to what you're going to be able to do, absorb, and tolerate. Many times, 
this is going to determine the foods that you're going to be able to eat and tolerate. And we'll talk a little bit more as we decide as we go through the slides today. I want to address these for you. Um, partial bowel obstructions tend to be the biggest contributing factor to, re to readmits or admits or sent people being sent to the ER. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But these are all big problems and risk factors for you. So based on your type of tumor and your symptoms, we will discuss what we need to do for diets, okay? So for those of you who have no problems, you're normal, you have been diagnosed, but you haven't had GI surgeries, you haven't had your gallbladder removed yet, you haven't had uh, resections, you're not, uh, it's not a PNET, you're not having hyperglycemia, you're having no problems. Well, if you're not having any problems, what we would do in the States would be put you on what the USDA considers a healthy diet. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But basically, that's a diet that's l low in concentrated sweets and sugar and, and low in fat. Not, not no fat by any means. I couldn't come to New Orleans if it wasn't. <laughs> Digestive problems will set the presence of how we set up your meal plans. This will include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, steatorrhea, which is probably one of the biggest problems that many of you are having, which is a fatty stool from fat malabsorption, which occurs many times as a result of the medications we put you on. Remember that these great drugs that are helping you, the sandostatins, the lanreotides, and when they're given to you, they decrease some of the things that were, they're, they're really a blocker, and they block these neurotransmitters. In doing that, they also do some of the things that we don't want them to do, and that is decrease the amount of pancreatic enzymes that are released and the ability to digest foods because you don't have enough of pancreatic enzymes. Surgery is the same way. Many of you will go to surgery and have your gallbladder re removed. I'm in New Orleans and I'm in practice and I, they took out mine too. And if you see me run off stage, you'll know I ate something this morning I shouldn't. Because this is also a big problem when you do not have the right amount of bile. And I'll try to do this, B-I-L-E, in case you, it's a harder word for me to get to you. Constipation can be a problem. Many times when we don't want to have a bowel movement, we don't drink fluids. We are smart. We know if we do this, if we decrease fluid, you don't have as much trouble going to the bowel movement, but you can create constipation. And remember, if nobody's told you this before, much of fatigue syndrome is from diet. Although oncology patients have fatigue. If you, and we'll talk more about this when we get to sugary foods, but just, if I say it three times, you may remember, if you are drinking or eating concentrated sweets, sugary foods, even if they're healthy, even if you go get one of those important little shakes that everybody wants to have and juice, this is gonna make your blood sugars go up higher than normal. If you have no protein or fat with you, it's gonna make it dro drop below normal and this will make you have fatigue syndrome. And many times we see this, not just in this disease, but in many diseases as a way to try to get this energy load back up. So it's going to play against you. So we'll talk a little bit more about how to create a more sound diet. Carcinoid syndrome and flushing is real. I see it in practice, and I've seen it since day one. Many times when you go on medications, this will end. Or many times when you go back to surgery and they can get the tumor vault down, some of this will, will, will end again. So this may come and go without your lifespan with this disease. But remember that it can be based on, on diet. Um, it's usually from the aging process of foods. We heard about the tryptophan. She spoke on turkey, which now is the, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. But um, usually it's a precursor to the tryptophan that's an issue. And that's more of an amino acid called tyramine and tyrosine. Um, flushing is a syndrome, and foods can do that. The aging process of foods can do that. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And hyperglycemia, for many of us, if you had a pre-existing diabetes, it's an issue. If you have uh, a peen, what we would call PNET, or have some issues with side effects of drugs, these can also play a part. 
So what does a calorie need for patients? Well, basically, this is just a real rule of thumb. As a dietitian, everybody's different. You'll hear me say that. So, but basically, women need somewhere between 16 and 2,000 calories. If you're going through treatment, this may go above this, this amount. Um, and if you're losing weight, it will definitely go above this amount. Um, men, the same. 20 to 20, 2,000 to 2,400 is basically where we try to get your diet. Um, if you're losing weight, we add 500 calories a day because we're math, you know, we like math. Dietitians, everything we do is based on an estimation and equations of math, basically. So if we want you to gain weight, we add 500 calories because in five, one pound is 3,500 calories so of body weight. So if I add 500 calories every day or a week, It'll leak 3,500 calories, and I should be able to at least give you a difference of one pound. We should stop you from losing that pound, or we should start gaining back one pound. If you need to lose weight, reverse that. But I'm not great at getting people to lose weight. I'm really good at getting people to hold on or gain weight or treat symptoms. Protein. Protein's a little bit different. The basic norm is somewhere between 0 .1, 0 0.8 and 1 gram per kilogram body weight. If you have going through active treatment or we have protein issues, then we're going to go up on this somewhere between 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram body weight. But any time that you increase protein, you have to increase fluid because of um, the need for fluids going to go up with high protein diets. So we, we try to do things in smaller servings, and this is really the basis. I think that it's real important from the start of this that you realize that the slide that she showed on symptoms before said one big message. What we know is large servings cause more syndrome. Large servings cause you to express more of the tryptophan, the things that are going to empty your GI tract that we've heard already this morning. It'll also contribute to fatigue syndrome, which is a lot of problems that we see. So we try to break your day down into, I put everybody on six feedings in practice. I want you to do little amounts throughout the day so you keep a steady flow of energy, you get a steady chance of absorbing what you have, you don't get such large boluses that you're going to lose what you get because that does us no good nutritionally. So this is some of the sources. Um, we talked about fat. Fat really is hard to, um, to absorb. Um, one of the slides we've seen referred to pancreatic enzymes. And some of you, uh, many of you may be on pancreatic enzymes. This helps you to digest mainly the, it has the lipase that's going to help you digest the, the, the fats in your diet. But I'm going to assume with these slides that you're not on anything. So in that sense, the leaner the meat, the better, or poultry, or whatever we're feeding you, is going to be absorbed better because you, a lot of the problems that you're going to have are related to the steatorrhea and no gallbladder. In the United States, we have, we have good research and um, in, in one group that really will look at diet. Many people don't get paid for diet and food, so they don't do the research, and that's why we have such trouble with this. But I will say that red meat is not as big enemy in everybody, and if you want red meat, and it's okay that we don't see even an increase in can colon cancer, which is our, our GI cancers, which are really our biggest ones, till we get up around 15 or 18 ounces a week. Well, that includes beef, lamb, and pork. Pork is not the other white meat. Pork is a red meat. So of those, if you're using a little throughout the week, it's fine. Just be careful with the amounts. And the, really the risk is colon cancer. and It is not neuroendocrine related that we know of at this time. Poultry can be consumed. There are certain parts of poultry that may have the tryptophan in higher levels, but we're not too sure that that's really a contributing. But I will tell you anecdotally, I use it. I hate in Louisiana, we have a big big festivals around Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving is based around a turkey. It's also based around a lot of stuff that you wouldn't get any other time of the year that's usually high in fiber, high in sugar, high in fat. So I hate Thanksgiving for patients because that's usually when we get in trouble is around holiday food that somebody might 
So I'm not going to say if I know it's a turkey yet. I hope to have more knowledge in these. And if we do, are able to run some better surveys and symptom surveys among patients, we may be able to get some better answers on these. Fresh fish, if it is a fatty fish, it is good for your heart. But if you do not tolerate fats, it's no better for you than any other fats that you're consuming, so be very careful with these. Um, foods that, uh, there's many other areas of, um, of fish that are leaner that may be better for you, to, easier for your body to tolerate. So you may want to be looking at haddock and some other things that are not quite so fatty. Wild game is acceptable and is in many areas. I'm not too sure how much. I know my husband always said he came to Canada to hunt ducks, so if that's really what he was doing, y'all have duck up here. <laughs> but these things can be consumed, and they tend to be lean, and they're very acceptable. Quinoa is a total protein. It's in the grain, and many of our, I have uh, taken care of vegetarians for years, and they use this as a big part of their diet. Lentils, soy, nut butters, avoiding nuts themselves, and that's because of the irritation to the GI tract. And dried beans, if you're having diarrhea, you may want to watch these. These are things you may not tolerate. Be careful with these. Lentils, not so much. Soy can cause gas in some people. We have to be very careful with that. Nut butters are fatty. If you're not on a pancreatic enzyme, although they're very good for you, you may not tolerate them very well. Nuts are really hard to digest. They are um, irritating to the GI tract, and so be careful. Dried beans the same way. They're healthy in a sense for other people, but if your cannot, body does not break these down well, especially red, black, and pinto, these can actually cause more harm than good to you because they're going to cause you to die, not to be able to digest. So now, you can blend them and you can puree them, and if you can get the fiber down in them, then sometimes that, that, those can be tolerated a little bit better. Fresh seafood is good, tends to be lean, tends to be absorbed well, and these can definitely be part of your diet. And if you're in Louisiana and you see alligator, it's okay to eat that as well. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about grains. <clears throat> Complex carbohydrates are very important to all diets. I know that there's a lot of, we kind of go full circle a lot of times in diets, and I've been doing this a long time, so I've seen a lot of circles come and go. And I've seen a real decrease in the acknowledgement of the benefit of grains, but I'm here to tell you, and especially in the, the room I'm in, that complex carbohydrates are your best energy source. This is where you get the energy for, for, from foods. It's not from proteins. It's a hard, you can get it, but it has to break down a different way, and it's hard to accept that. And fat's the same way. They're good at insulating us and, and keeping structure together, but they're not a great energy source. Much, if you're avoiding these foods, then that can contribute to fatigue syndrome. So be very, very careful with that. Okay, for all of my ones that are in here that have no issues, in the United States, we recommend 35 grams of fiber a day. And this is mixed between two types of fiber, insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber does not break down in your body. Its benefit is that it goes through you fairly quickly. And for the normal people in here where we're trying to prevent colon cancer, we want things to go through you fairly quickly. We want to reduce the toxins out there. And we're going to get a normal bowel movement. For those of you that are having frequent bowel movements, we want to slow it down. We want to reduce the amount of transit time, so we use more soluble fiber. Soluble fiber is the inside of the beans that we were talking about, so that's one of those foods that's really a combination food. Um, it's the inside of the fruits, it's not the skin. The skin is the insoluble part of an apple. The inside is where you get the soluble fibers from. This is going to be changed. If you have diarrhea, try to choose foods that are higher from soluble fibers and less insoluble fibers. Very important change that I make on almost everybody that I see. It also helps your body, your GI tract, absorb water, and that's an important part of reducing symptoms as well. So we want to try to find the ones, the foods that are non-gassy. And again, these are the same foods that can cause gas in some, in some people. There was a diet put out called FODMAP. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with it. Is it some of you familiar with it? 
Um, I, I tend to use it in practice uh, as really an identif identification of foods that may be gassy more than trying to get you on a strict diet. I want you to understand that there are some foods that tend to cause more gas. And these foods are going to cause you pain. When they say, don't send you to the dietitian for pain, you better go if you're having food after, after your, you're having pain after your meals. Because some of this is very related to your diet. So be careful with that. Low fiber, if you're ordered it, I talked about small bowel obstructions. Many times it's the fiber mixed with the protein, but fiber that can actually get stuck and cause this, this obstruction, okay? So be very careful with that. And your doctor may say, I need you on a low fiber diet. And this is considered less than 13 grams per day. So if your owner have been told to be on a low fiber diet, Choose more of soluble fibers than insoluble and keep it to 13 grams a day. If you go see a physician, I mean, a, even a dietitian that's not been trained in neuroendocrine tumors, and there's very few of us. I'm not going to say that there's a lot of us out there. That's why you brought me all the way from New Orleans. <laughs> if there was one here, you might already be, be, have heard some of this. But do remember that, that if they don't know, to have them contact one of us, or you can take the information that you see today back to them as well so that they'll know the parameters that they're working with. Okay, let's talk a little bit about grains. So quinoa we talked about, it can be used as a total protein, it's mostly soluble fibers, and it's usually pretty well absorbed. Um, potatoes get a bad rap out there. Everybody wants to talk bad about our potatoes. Well, without the skin, it's probably one of the easiest things to absorb, and if you're having a bad day, Potatoes can really give you a lot of relief. Just small amounts can really help you. Um, a little potato soup, I tend to do. I don't do a lot of soupy things, but that's one of them. Sometimes you can just absorb this slowly, um, and, and it can really help you. The rice is the same way. South Louisiana, we eat a lot of white rice. That's why, really why we're obese. <laughs> Probably didn't eat the fried food. has a lot of calories in it. But when we need to get calories in patients, white rice is a great benefit. And, it can, I can, and I have put out recipes. We used to back in the day, and if you've ever worked in foreign countries or anything, actually rice is a big part of these diets. And we know that it's a real big part at, of electrolyte replacement, especially in children in foreign countries. So we can even do rice milk. And rice milk on your really, really bad days can really set your stomach okay, and it can be tolerated. I've tried to make it flavorful, and you may see some recipes I put out. It's, it's a challenge. You can put nutmeg, you can put cinnamon, you can do different things, but remember that this can be a benefit. Pasta is very good. It absorbs easily, right? That's why if you're, if you're obese, they say don't eat pasta, right? Because they don't want you to absorb everything. I mean, you're really going to have get too many calories from it. But for the audience I'm speaking to today, and many times you're losing weight, and you need things that you can tolerate, pastas, noodles, or one of those. So remember that it's very usable in your meal pattern. Ooh, I'm so sorry. I'm that. Uh, couscous is one of those as well, and that can be tolerated. Breads with less than three grams of fiber, that's basically a white or a white, and it can be brown, it can be whole grain. It, it just doesn't need to be 12 grain. You can see the seeds, you can see all the fibers in it because those things are usually the things that irritate the GI tract and are hard to digest. So, so, the, um, so be careful with those, um, especially if you're on a low fiber diet or have been ordered a low fiber diet. But I can tell you those high grains you're trying to get healthy with are just hard to digest. I mean, they just irritate the GI tract so badly. Cereals that are whole grain, oatmeal, I say, you know, I'm not going to use name brands, but things that are based on oatmeal, things that are based on rice products tend to be tolerated a little better. Wheat's not the same. Now, y'all may have wheat up here that's different than what we get in the States, but wheat's been modified quite a bit from what we were, you know, the generations before us have gone and, and manipulation and maybe what's in it. You may have wheat intolerance, and I see it. It's not all gluten. I can tell you, everybody wants to be gluten free. It's not really gluten necessarily in the, in the audience that I'm speaking to today. There are people that have celiac sprue, and there, I have patients that have celiac sprue. It has nothing to do with this disease, but 
But for those people, I have to be very strict with gluten. And I have patients that have irritants to gluten, so they're real. And it's very gassy at times, okay? But it's also what makes our bread so pretty and crusty down in New Orleans. That's why we have great pull boys, okay? So it's not the enemy, but it may be the wheat itself in some people. I do see intolerances. Try to choose foods that have less than the three grams that we spoke about. If you're looking at the, it's not too, too high. In some other areas of what we're doing, we want that, but not when you're having malabsorption and diarrhea. If you're having trouble with constipation and everything else is normal, you can up that some. But make sure you up your fluids if you up your fiber. Those things work together. <clears throat> some of the ones that would tend to be easy to absorb in the cereals are the oatmeal, the grits, and cream of wheat. Fruits. One of the things that we know about syndrome is, is the aging process of foods. And, and I did, I'm going to talk about it, and I may have skipped over a little bit more of it when we talk about meats, but it's the aging process that really causes um, the breakdown to the amino acid that contributes to the most problems that we have with carcinoid syndrome or flush, flushing in particular. Definitely flushing. So that's where you'll see an overripe banana can cause flushing. An overripe avocado can cause flushing. Uh, these things get softened as they age, and it's that process that really can, is where you're getting those amino acids. So any aged food for that matter, that's why I really try to, for, for not just uh, this reason, but as for also for uh, food storage benefits, it really is beneficial for you to cook your food, put it up, eat your food, but don't, store your food for two and three days because again it's an aging process and if you're flushing and you're having issues with this it very well can be the aging process that's occurring in your refrigerator or your kitchen so for, to help you and nobody needs to cook one meal at a time when you cook things cook enough cool it store it in your freezer so that in individual packets so that you can take them down and it's still usable and it's friendly food safe food um, but be careful with these and then, and then also take the pills off because if you're having trouble with diarrhea because it's those pills on there that's that ir insoluble fiber we were talking about that may very well be causing the irritation. Uh, canned foods in their own juice. One of the biggest problems that we have with dumping syndrome, and many of you have dim uh, some form of dumping syndrome, means that things get to your stomach and your small intestine and they go right through you, is because of your sugar content. High sugary foods cause dumping syndrome. I have seen people say, oh, well, they, they left enough of my small intestine, I don't have that, but I go to the bathroom right after I eat. Well, you're dumping. And sometimes, and, and you may have explained this, but sometimes when we're taking out these, when they, the surgeons, I take credit for all their work. Um, <laughs> when we're taking out the GI tract, we actually have to take out the lymph nodes that will keep it from going back up to your liver and you get really, a, a, like in a breast cancer patient, you actually can see where you have a lymph, uh, you know, the lymph system's holding fluid. Well, that can happen in GI tract and it can become very sluggish and not work very well either on absorption. So keep the sugar content down, not because it makes cancers grow, but because it makes you go to the bathroom more often. It causes dumping syndrome. So try to get your can in their own juice or water pack or rinse the heavy syrup off. Juice should be dialed, if, in my opinion, and I've done this a long time, I'm telling you what I've listened and watched too. That's how I learn more than anything I've learned is because I sit down with you and I listen to what you tell me. And I've been doing this since 2002, and I'm old. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. So dilute your fruit juice with water or Gatorade or anything else that you're getting and make sure you're drinking caf decaffeinated issues. Caffeine makes everything move through you faster. It's just the nature of this beast, okay? But diluted, I, I tend to go three to one juice, two parts water, three parts water. I don't mind if you have a little to flavor your water, but I don't want it for the reasons that you're consuming it probably. And then there's some people that have trouble with uh, with acids, and so we're gonna talk more about what well, we won't today, but we'll watch those kind of things. Some of your fruits are gonna have high fiber contents, and I've listed some of these, pineapple, watermelon, dried fruits, and all of these can also increase your risk of obstruction. Vegetables, make sure they're chopped very well. If you're having diarrhea, 
You really, I like to have you steam them, do something to try to break them down, chop them real well, or leave them out. Avoid things that are not going to be able to be broken down. Frozen and canned. There are no salt added if your hypertension you know, is a problem. We tend to like to get people without too much salt, rinse them, whatever you need to do. But these things are acceptable, and you need to keep things in your refrigerator or in your shelves that you can get. Avoid cruciferous vegetables. These are very gassy. This is your cabbage, your cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and onions, onions. And we put onions in everything down south. Y'all may put them up here as well. Low-fat dairy. Dairy can be tolerated. Sometimes it's not the lactose that you're having problems with, but the, the fat content of the dairy. So make sure that you can um, work with that. Also try to get the no added sugar if you're using an alternative dairy. Uh, these will help your tolerance. Low fat cheeses and things like that. Aged cheese can cause you to dump. I mean, sorry, to have your syndrome. Well, it'll cause you to dump too, but it'll cause you to have syndrome. It's the aging process of this. That does it. It's the same thing. Aged meats, aged smoked meats. We're going to run out of time. I'm going to throw this at you real quick. Uh, cured meats. Anytime you've aged, you put pepperoni on a pizza, you're increasing your risk of, because cheese and pepperoni, of syndrome. Fats. Remember that they're okay, but the serving size is a teaspoon. If it's a low, um, or it's a, if it's a, what they're going to say, a light margarine is a tablespoon, but that's a serving size. And that's the same thing with avocado. The serving size of an avocado is the size of my finger. It's not a half a cup of guacamole. So you got to be careful with these things. You're not going to tolerate them any better. And if you're taking pancreatic enzymes, you may want to remember to adjust your pancreatic enzymes depending on the amount of fat in your diet. Beverages are very important. We need you to consume the same amount of fluid as everybody with a normal GI tract. It's a little bit of a challenge when we have patients that don't, be, don't tolerate fluids in large masses at one time. So I do recommend you sip on fluids throughout the day. Keep the little cups with you that you can sip on throughout the day and try to get your intake. Usually you don't tolerate more than four ounces at a time. You need to do it, but if you're having diarrhea, especially if you're having dumping syndrome, they need to be done 30 to 45 minutes before you eat or after you eat. Consume only small sips while you're drinking, and it should be sugar-free and caffeine-free. Carbonated beverages cause gas and bloating. Seasoning. Use all these wonderful herbs. I grow, I'm in South Louisiana, and I'm at, I actually live in the country on these waterways. But I grow a, a garden full of vegetables every year, and I grow a lot of herbs, and, and I use these herbs in my cooking. We said onions can't be tolerated very well, but chives can, and they give you the onion flavor. So use it, the, and it's fun to grow. We've talked about stress relief. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of rewarding feelings when you've grown your basil, you've grown your oregano, and then you're using it in your cooking. It gives you a lot of satisfaction. It also helps you a lot. When you're cutting down fat, you need to add flavor. That's how we get the adjustment. Garlic can also be uh, gassy, um, so be careful with that. The main thing I want you to know is that if it burns your tongue, it's going to burn all the way down, but this is also the same thing that causes flushing. So watch your, your hot, your heated foods. Those are usually your problem. Prepare foods that you can tolerate. Try not to use a frying, deep frying, but you can saute, you can grill, you can braise, you can broil, bake. Avoid raw foods. You do not have the immune system, for most of you, to be able to fight foodborne illnesses very well. Okay? So be careful with that. Separate your ch chopping boards. Ask someone, you know, cook. Be car careful with your food. Foodborne illnesses will send you straight back to that hospital. Again, here we go. Eight, avoid the aged and fermented foods because they're going to increase your carcinoid syndrome. Avoid meats, fruits, and vegetables associated with syndrome. Avoid MSG. Not that it, ca it causes everybody to flush. I can't tell whether you're having flushing from syndrome or you're having it from MSG. And let me tell you, in the States, I don't know how it is up here, it's in almost all the fast foods you'll ever go to. The highest amount, I'm a teacher, I sent my students out to find it. Green beans at Kentucky Fried Chicken was the highest MSG. It was not at the Chinese restaurant. Be very careful. Avoid alcohol beverages. Plan your meals. Plan your grocery list. Then you'll know what you're going to be planning to eat. If you wait till you're hungry, 
to decide what you're going to eat, you're going to mess up. You're going to make a mistake. But if you know what you're going to eat tomorrow, today, you can do this. It takes preparation. Don't go hungry to the grocery store. Take your list, read your labels, replace your pantry staples. You should have them there. You should not have to make fast adjustments. Plan ahead. Choose small frequent feedings. Take the medications that your doctor orders. They never do you any good if they stay in the bottle. That we know. Dining out, you need to look at the menus ahead of time. Review them before you get there. Ask the chef to make you something different. They don't mind, and it gives them a chance to really do something different. Watch things that say cream, high fat. Pureed vegetables can be used wonderfully in foods. It's a wonderful way to add moisture to foods. And in conclusion, just remember, just like zebras have all different stripes, you all have different individual stripes. Everybody is different. You need to see dietitians that know what they're doing with this disease because you're not like a cancer patient in many other aspects. So thank you for having me today. I'll be around all day, and I'm glad to take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne.